אני אתחיל רק בשתי מילים בעברית. הדובר הבא הוא יוסף ריינר ברזן, דוקטור יוסף ריינר ברזן, חבר טוב. אני אוהב לומר עליו שנהירים שבילי אשכנז כשבילי גרמניה. זה לא יוצא כל כך טוב כמו המקום. אוקיי. דוקטור ריינר יוסף ברזן הוא היסטוריון ספציאליזם במדיבל ג'ויש היסטורי. הוא עובד ומתחיל את האינסטיטוט for Jewish studies at the Westfalish Wilhelm Universität in Münster, Germany, between 2010-2014. He was a fellow at the Martin Buber Society in the Humanities at the Hebrew University. In his new project, he focuses on the individual and communal practices of memorial of the dead in the medieval Ashkenaz. His first book in German, Takanoch Gehilot Shum, the communal uh, ordinance of the communities of mind, Bronx and Speyer, in the high and late Middle Ages. Um, today we will speak about West and East in Ashkenaz in the time of Yehuda Hasi. השני של ההרצאה. אז קודם כל על גיאוגרפיה. Jews and Christians live in the same political and geographical context and not just in the middle in, in the medieval centuries. They are actors in commonly formative culture spaces and receive if not in the same way, the geographical and political in in interpretations of these spaces, which reach from past times into their respective present. I would like to make these general statements first in order to, to describe some fundamentals on, an, uh, on, uh, on, on the understanding of Hebrew geographical terminology, which will be instrumental in this presentation to better understand Yehuda Hasid and his father's move from the Middle Rhine region, Speyer, to Regensburg. Why did Samuel Abraham Yudha Hasid leave the Rhineland and move to Regensburg beyond reasons of piety, and why to Regensburg? These old and feminine questions will be placed under a new stage and in new settings here. I would like to describe the Rhineland's geopolitical situation at the time when the aforementioned members of the Kalonymous family moved away, as well as the meanings of this move to Regensburg in the second half of the, of the 12th century. I will not do this, however, from the context of the, on, on, of the, of the, of the scholar's life circumstances, as Ezrain did. I am more interested in the larger picture. What opportunity and motivations may have played a role in, in, in a Jewish family moving its place of residence from the center, the Middle Rhine region, to the supposed periphery, the eastern edge of the German kingdom at the time? Can this move to Regensburg not be seen as part of a new movement that would bring about further Jewish community settlements in the eastern territories of the kingdom in the coming generations? And finally, could these Jewish settlement movements eastwards be seen as the solely Jewish phenomena? It is not rather part of a movement that included the Gentile population of the, of the German nation, which started as a domestic, as a domestic colonization of the western territories and in the end, between the 11th and 14th centuries, led to the settlement and economic conquest of new regions, along with the Jews, who were moving eastwards. 
On the Jewish side, this movement, which can be reconstructed from settlement docu documentation, is illustrated in the Hebrew terminology for geopolitical entities in high medieval Hebrew literature and Hebrew Latin. A comparison of Hebrew geographical terms with contemporary Latin and vernacular variants and their geographical meanings will help clarify the extent to which Hebrew terms followed um, a Jewish perception or despite linguistic diverge divergence only gave a separate term for a perception of an examination for a perception of the geopolitical world common to both Jews and Christians. An examination of the word Ashkenaz in its political and geographical meaning, especially in the 12th and 13th century, may be necessary and fruitful for our discussion. And I will now begin my analysis. Judah Hasid's move from Speyer to Regensburg and its background will form the framework of our investigation. <coughs> in modern research, Ashkenaz is, constructed, is a constructed virtual term that regularly describes the Jews of the German language and culture region during the High and Late Middle Ages. Until recently, it was also applied to the Jews of northern France during the same time period. In the research of the of, of early modern period, there is a tendency to, to call the entire settlement area of the, of, of the Jews that were thereafter called Ashkenazim, including Poland and Italy, as Ashkenaz. Here, here the Hebrew name orients itself on the Jewish residents and how they call themselves. This in, this, in turn, is a scientific construct, and that does not necessarily conform clearly to the finds in early modern sources. During the, high middle, uh, during the medieval centuries, the term Ashkenaz was the exact opposite. It was a geopolitical expression that changed and became concrete, like the term German lands did. Starting with Ashkenaz from the Biblical Table of Nations, the term was combined in rabbinical writings with another term, Germania, and thus so possibly allusions to the Latin name Germania, an area on the border of the ancient Roman world. The reference to old political absolute terminology certainly fits the character of Christian Latin literature of the same time as uh, with Isidore of Sevilla, for example. The area called Germania in Latin writings since Roman times has at least two names in Hebrew writings after the 12th century. It is called Ashkenaz, which I consider to be all, an, uh, as well an inner Ashkenazi uh, term, and Alemania, which reflects an outer Romance perspective. Thus, for the 12th century, uh, author of the Sefer Sechalia, uh, Sefer Sechilan, Sechan, Ephraim of Bonn, Ashkenaz, is the country where he lives and to which he and other Jews of this land have an emotional relationship. For this reason, I, as well, it seems logical to me to look for an existing political entity behind the name Ashkenaz in the 12th century. Is it possible to delineate the borders of this Ashkenaz and to understand something about a Jewish perception of its inner political structure? First, let me point out that the 12th century scholars were familiar with the inner political structure of their countries of residence. Let the geographical description of the effective range of the, of the Takanot Rabbein Mutam serve as an example. And I will not read this text, I will only show you the meaning of the mentioning names. Um, here's a, a map of France of the 12th century, the Kingdom of France. Uh, and you see here uh, a list of names where these letters uh, went, and you see Troyes and Dijon and Auxerre and Sceaux and Orléans and Chalon and Reims and Paris and Melon and Etampes, which are, so to say, the, uh, uh, the inner part of France, the part which is really ruled by the French king, and you have Anjou and Poitiers under the English rule, and in the end, you have already a region uh, which is called uh, Lothair, beyond the eastern border of the Kingdom of France. In addition, another probably later transmission of the Takanot of Rabbi Nutam emphasizes that Ashkenaz lies east of Lothair. Thus, both terms were used together and had different meanings. This is a writing called Tzatzamate and it was sent to the entire diaspora in the kingdom of Tzarfat and Lothar and Ashkenaz. 
The fact that circular letters under the authority of Rabbi Otam were sent both to Noter and to Ashkenaz can be reconstructed from other transmissions. They prove that these circulars uh, uh, containing the Takanot of Rabbi Otam were confirmed by both Eliezer Bal Shim and Shimshon in Cologne and Eliezer Bal Nathan in Mainz through their signature. Thus, the, re the, re uh, the recipient to, to be sought in the, in the community of Cologne, which was the geopolitical part of uh, Lothel, in this map here in green, as it not only saw, as it not Latin sources, but also remarks in 12th century Hebrew chronicles confirm. The community of Mainz, headed by Eliezer Bar Nathan, called be, could be the addresses in Ashkenaz, which also reflects the political reality of the city of Mainz and its surrounding, since it, like bombs in French Bayer, were never seen as part of Lorraine, so as part of Lothair, in blue here, on this part of the map. So if Mainz is to be found in Ashkenaz, what kind of geographical phenomenon or political entity does Ashkenaz refer uh, to the, to, in the 12th century? After the demise of the Roman Empire, the duchies of five German, uh, Germanic tribes were established east of the Rhine and the later Lorraine, later Lothair, in the early Middle Ages, which later became part of the Frankish Empire. After the demise of the Frankish Empire, these duchies, there are Bavaria, Swabia, Franconia, Saxonia, and Thuringia, began to form a separate entity, a separate political entity. In this political unit, known as the Regnum Teutonicum, among other names, and when you translate this, it's the kingdoms of what we call them of Germans, the, uh, the Teutones, the kingdom of the Germans was formed as a union of the five tribal duchies, um, at first without a reign to the west. Mm, these duchies and their names were not unknown to the 13th century Hebrew writings either. Meir of Rosenburg mentioned the following regions in one of his responsa. And they are, uh, of course, in Hebrew, of course, Sassonia, Befranca, Be Elsas, Be Reynos, and smaller regions, and Bayern. And at the end of his testament, Jude Hasid mentioned as well an uh, Eretz Schwaben. Uh, this list is uh, therefore so important because it really forms um, the whole thing together, if you see it in it here, the central part of the German lands. Um, only in the 9th century does the reign approach to the Lake Nome and became part of it. Nevertheless, because of its early Christianization compared to the five duchies and its Roman roots in the following centuries, Lorraine, our Lothair, will continue to be perceived, perceived as a separate region distinct from the five tribal duchies. The duchies. In written sources, a common factor and binding element of the five tribes along with the political aliens of, uh, of of a, of a common king was the common language called Deutsch, Deutsch, which was also the source of the tribal collective common name, Deutsche, die Deutsche. The 12th the Germans, the 12th century Hebrew chronicles followed this definition, who, he, uh, who knew the name Ashkenazim, die Deutschen, a Germanim for the recent Gentile inhabitants and distinguished them from the Zalfatim, the French. The collective term, which uh, term, term, uh, terminologically equates the German language area and the, and, and, and the alliance of the five duchies in a, in, in a common kingdom, whether it, it be called Ashkenazim Ashkenaz or Deutsche Deutsche Lande, can be found in a poem by the German poet Walter von der Vogelweide at the turn of the 13th century, they say around 1204. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in this hymn of praise to the German land and its inhabitants, the German women, the Tuition Fruven, and the German men, the Tuition men and their virtues, Tuition Zucht, he described the country's borders uh, from the Elbe to the Rhine, runter nach nach Ungarland, from the Elbe to the Rhine and back to Hungary. Um, uh, and note here the eastern borders of the German lands at the river Elbe and the Hungarian border. Uh, here at this map, it is the colors pink and the color blue and the color of orange. What these colors are means, well, I mean, I will we'll later speak about that, but this is the German lens of uh, Walter von der Vogelweide around 1200. 
The geographical lo localization of Ashkenaz, especially its eastern borders, has been transmitted quite precisely in Hebrew writings as well from the air area of, of, the, of Provence, Iberia. Thus, uh, David Kimbri, and not he alone, a contemporary of Yehudi Hasid who lived in southern France, in his uh, commentary on the book of Ovadia, with, uh, with the terms Alemannia, Ashkenaz, quite clearly distinguishes both terms, quite clearly uh, uh, it describes what we have identified as the German lands, the Lecum Teutonicum or the Deutsche Lande. And these are the nations, the lands Alemannia and Ashklonia and Zalfatsch, which, uh, which, which, which they call also Francia. And it continues a little bit down. Um, uh, well, you see, uh, Ashkolonia, these are the red territories. And I put also the Hebrew terms in here. Uh, uh, Kimpley wrote Ashkolonia, uh, even Ezra called it Sklavonia, which makes the whole thing more uh, logical. Um, it is said that the inhabitants of the countries of Alemannia were once can Canaanite, from when the Canaanites withdrew from before the approach of Yeshua, as it is written in the book of Yeshua, they took off for the land of Alemannia and Ashkelonia or Sklavia, which are called the land of Ashkenaz. And they are called Canaanites, Slavim or slaves, uh, until today. At first, David Kimchi's description seems unclear. Three countries are named, Tzafat, Alemannia, Ashkelonia. While Tzafat can probably be identified with the northern kingdom of France, at least with the Ile de France or the royal domain, Using the term Ashkenaz together with Alemannia and Ashkelonia or Sklavonia is confusing. So I suggest the following in interpretation, which can be brought into harmony with the historical political situation of the, of the German land at the turn of the 11th and 12th century. In my understanding, Radak uses Eretz Ashkenaz for Alemannia and Ashkelonia or Sklavonia together. The later Sklavonia refers to the regions next to Alemannia, which were still occupied mainly by Slavs, so to say, in, in the 11th and 12th century, so the Red Territories. Radak describes the political reality at the eastern edge of the five duchies in the 12th century. Since the 11th century, Um, since um, the 11th century, new political entities had developed east of the old settlement borders. This is, uh, the old settlement borders are the territory in pink. In the southeast of German settlements, orange, these had become German lands in just a few generations. Um, most of the territories of Austria, Coventria, and Steyr. Thus, the German language era was extended to the Hungarian border in the 11th century already, as Walter von der Vogel rightly described it. The expansion of the German lands, political, ethnic, and linguistic, continued to the northeast in the 12th century, blue here, crossed the Elbe and Saale River, and in the 13th century it crossed the Oder River, this is green, um, uh, on here on the right side of the map. Uh, new political entities were created within the new borders of the empire that were based on existing Slavic tribe societies together with the new German migrants, they got the names Mecklenburg, Meissen, Lausitz, Pomerania, and uh, Silesia. And, well, we are in at this area, more Mecklenburg, Lausitz, Pomerania, and uh, Silesia. Yeah, here is Slovenia. You can here also orient, orient yourself because the names, the names of the regions are mentioned here on this side. Um, <coughs> the formation of the new German lands north and south of the Bohemian Bazaar and the Bohemian Kingdom which was afterwards, which was not Germanized, called still Knaan in Hebrew sources, was paralyzed by Ashkenazi Jewish settlement eastwards. Just a few generations later, Jewish settlers created a new Ashkenaz, or I would call it East Ashkenaz, in the new eastern territories, parallel to their German Christian neighbors. Next to, with the old Ashkenaz or West Ashkenaz, and with his, and with, his, uh, with opportunities to establish new Jewish uh, communities and centers of Jewish learning. You see here the old um, uh, Jewish communities with red signs till 1100, with blue signs till um, 1200, and with green signs till 1300. Uh, so to say, you see this late parallel, uh, two or three generations later. Here, the new Jewish arrivals from the West often accounted already existing Jewish structures, not only in Prague, but also, but also in Meissen, where, for example, also Oerlitz, in Spandau, and other places. 
Here is Prague, here is Meissen, here is Spandau, here is, for example, Wien, uh, here in this new territories, which are parallel here to the Sclavonia, which was here in red. Mm. Mm. Which uh, leads to the conclusion that Jewish settlements was also taking place from the east, Krakow, Kiev, Constantinople, before the Ashkenazi arrived. Likewise, there was likely interaction between uh, the various uh, Jewish cultural spheres, whereby, just like in German Christian settlements, the Ashkenazi tradition in its new local variants dominated and in most cases displaced the already existing Jewish culture. I will just mention uh, the well-known article of Tashma, where you also, also were trying to, to describe this. At the old borderline between the old German lands, so this is this borderline, um, uh, between West Ashkenaz and the new German lands, in Jewish categories of East Ashkenaz, two cities stands out uh, as the gateways to the new settlements region, and this is Magdeburg, here and uh, Regensburg. You see it at the very eastern frontier of the old German settlement of that frontier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Magdeburg for the new settlement movement in further context to the northeast, and Regensburg, where you would have a city, as a starting point for the trade and transport communication of ideas, goods, and people southeastwards to Austria, Hungary, and Byzantium, and eastwards to Prague, Poland, and Kiev. We will now briefly look at Regensburg's uh, special situation. When the family of Yehuda Hasid moved from Speyer to Regensburg in the second half of the 12th century, this prominent branch of the Kalonymus family only appeared to move its residents from the center to the periphery of the German kingdom. While Regensburg, as uh, the settlement map shows, lies in the extreme east of the old German language area in the transitional zone to the new settlements, and the Slavic world. In the 12th century, it is comparable to the range cities to its Roman roots. Ever since the development of the Bavarian tribal duchy, Regensburg was its spiritual and political center, a major see of the bishopric, and the residence of the Bavarian duke until the days of the imperial Frederick Barbarossa, and this means also until the days of Yehuda Fassi. Its function as a bridge to its neighbors, to the, um, to the east of the kingdom's new territories, was expressed in the city's economic rise, which was manifested in its building project, especially the building of the Stone Bridge in 1146, at the city's economical vital crossing point. During the Salian and Staufer era, Regensburg was one of the Roman German king's most important residences. During the reign of uh, Imperial Frederick I, he was no less frequently present in Regensburg than he was in the Rhineish people cities. The city's uh, geopolitical significance as the gateway to the east and to the road to Constantinople and, uh, uh, and beyond um, along the Danube River was more than evident to the 12th century empires, and, uh, and the Second Crusade in 1146 under Conrad III and the Third Crusade uh, in 1189 and Frederick I began here, and the later certainly already uh, witnessed by Yehuda Hasid. So, and now Yehuda Hasid. The Jewish community that the Kolonimus family from the Rhine, uh, Yehuda Hasid, his brother and his father, joined, was considered to be one of the oldest in the 12th century in Ashkenaz. While the Regensburg community was not blessed with a large number of trans-regional scholars, it should be noted that some of these scholars were in contact with the centers in France and had studied under Rabbi Nutan, and Rami Leinen knows much more about it, Efraim ben Yitzvah and Miguel ben Yoel and one or two others are known for that. The community's reputation seems also to have suffered from its behavior during the persecution during the First Crusade in 1096. Well, the majority of the community, unlike their brothers in faith, along the Rhine, prefers to convert tem temporary rather than, uh, rather than die as martyrs. Accepting authority from the Shun communities with their strict asceticism and their restricted ideas of pious and good fearing, uh, God fearing life may have helped, according to Abraham Schornsteiner, to move their uh, father's degrade, disgrace into the background. But it is certain that the presence of the Rhine of the Rhenish Kalonymus family and most prominent representative of the Rhenish uh, Hasidim uh, raised the value of the Regensburg community uh, interregionally. This happened first in the person of Yehuda e Hasid and his uh, perception and function already during his lifetime. Yehuda e Hasid seems to have taken an important position within the community 
and as a member of one of the most important scholarly families and the key figure of a special, uh, of a special let's call it religious group. Uh, he became the spiritual leader and recipient of responsa from the circles of the Jewish scholars both from the communities in the Old West as well as representative for Jewish communities and leaders beyond the old boundaries between the Germania and the Slavica. And this includes especially the, 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 the representative of, of, I call them, non-Ashkenazi communities in Bohemia and, and Poland, also shown by Tashman, but also initially context to members of communities with increasingly hybrid Jewish traditions in places in the new German territories like Meissen. Here. Now we see it a little bit better. Uh, here is nice. Um, or maybe even Vienna. The orientation to the east was naturally for the for, for, for the Jews of of, of of Regensburg as well, and, uh, and as the account of the Tafia travels from Regensburg to the east shows. Um, uh, well, yeah. Um, I think most important here is to to, to, um, to start to uh, get the, the the idea of this. Um, um, the people from the east, like Ozawa and others, who were starting to cross the borders here in, in, in the 12th century, uh, from, from, from the non-Ashkenazic world to the, uh, to, to the Ashkenazic world. Uh, in the end here, I also want to show you uh, at least another map and another source what I found, and because I, I think it's most interesting, I can't skip this either. It is a part of uh, uh, the last sentences, uh, at least one of the last sentences of his testament. It's an obscure note and at the end, uh, found at the end of his testament, and the text is like this. No rapper should settle in Heidelberg, no Cohen should settle in Regensburg, neither should Eliezer of Waltz. I thought maybe as a long as you meant. No one should settle in Augsburg, no one, uh, no married couple should settle in Austria, but it has already happened they should leave the duchy every year for one month. And when you do this, then you have this map. If we look at the locations, uh, and the order of which we were mentioned, we, we, we see a path from Heidelberg in the very west, not far from Speyer. That is the Schumkund, which, which were the, uh, the, the old ideal center of the west and the hometown of them as well, of Jude Hasid, via Augsburg, a new young community still in the west, to Regensburg, a new place of residence and center of the geographical frame of the place the places mentioned, and to Austria, and in the new east, and the other geographical end of the list. Without going into details on Yehuda Hasid's various statements, it became clear that Yehuda had, bio, bio, biographically connect, had biographical connections to at least the communities in the West, maybe also with Austria. He stayed in these places or regions himself for shorter or longer periods. I would even go a step further. All of the places mentioned had, or did have, when the testament was drawn up, Jewish residents who either sympathized with Yehuda Hasid's position or reacted to it in a certain way. So Yehuda is leaving instructions for people closely small circle and his religious positions for whom he feels himself responsible, but over whom he claims the highest level of authority. The dispersion of these followers from the Middle Rhine to Austria corresponds to his own life geography, but also to the new Jewish settlement movements from the Shum community to the old periphery, from the old centers to the new centers, from the old Ashkenaz to new Ashkenaz, from west to east. Thank you.